Thanks, Walter, and it's great to be here with you all. Great to be interviewing Paul Ryan, who I'll just add two sentences to Walter's introduction. I guess I've known in my years in Washington most of the major figures, certainly on the Republican side of the aisle, and not only is Paul Ryan one of the most dedicated public servants uh, of those figures, he's one of the nicest people, actually, to have attained prominence in Washington. Maybe you're not aware of this, that not everyone who succeeds in Washington is, is really very nice, and not everyone who's very nice succeeds in politics, but Paul is a, uh, an exception to the rule and uh, really a wonderful person as well as a, a, an intellectual leader and a political leader for Republicans and conservatives, so it's a pleasure to Thanks, interview you. He's coming off a big legislative victory. Let's pre begin briefly with that. As chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, he shepherded through uh, the free trade um, agreement, the, the authorization for the president to at least have fast track uh, ability to get his free trade agreement through Congress. Just last week in Congress, a rare bipartisan moment where a huge majority of Republicans followed Paul's lead in uh, giving the president authority he wanted. Most Democrats voted against it. How did that happen, and what did we learn from that? Well, um, first of all, when I heard the thunder and the lightning, I thought that was a cue for the Republicans to enter the stage, you know, when, when we got here. <laughs> so it's great to be here. Walter, thank you for your, your hospitality. I really appreciate it. Um, what, what was important about the moment we just had, which is, like you said, Bill, rare, was a bipartisan accomplishment, which is we established trade promotion authority so that the president can go get trade agreements for America. We have not had the ability to do this since 2007 when it last lapsed. What has happened since 2007 is there have been 100 trade agreements negotiated and put in place around the world since then, and we have been a party to none of them. What this means is other countries are going around the world getting better agreements between each other, and that means America's barriers against our exports going into other countries is getting higher and higher and higher, and we're losing as a result. The question is not, are we gonna rewrite the rules of the global economy? The rules are being written right now. The question is, who's going to write them? And so what we believed is it's important for America to get back in the game, it's important for America to lead, and we believe that no matter who the president is, we should go out and try and knock down trade barriers to our products so we can make more things in America, sell them overseas, and have America holding the pen when they're rewriting the rules for the global economy. And so, yes, this is one of those cases where Republicans joined with this president to do that. And I think it was very important for our country and very important for jobs. And, and how, hard, how hard was it to persuade your fellow Republicans in the House, uh, as well as in the Senate, to give, give the president his top legislative priority, give him more authority, actually, to negotiate, more leeway, this is not a party that trusts this president yeah, normally well, to give, give him more authority. I would argue it's not giving him more authority. It's just giving him the ability to go get an agreement and then bring it back to Congress. And then Congress decides at the end of the day whether or not we accept an agreement. But we sure have to try. And more importantly, our allies are wondering, are we going to be in the game? Are we going to stay America? Are we going to write the rules? We're in the middle of negotiating with 11 Pacific nations, not China, but other Asian nations, and they want to play by our rules. They want to adopt our free enterprise system. They want to use America as a counterweight to China, and we want access to their markets so we can sell our products and have more jobs. So it, it was making an economic and a foreign policy argument to our members who, mostly Republicans, you're right. Don't, look, I ran against the guy in the last election. I mean, good grief. Um, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, so, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, um, uh, <laughs> uh, so there was this, why are we helping this president do this? Because it's right for the country. And we impressed upon our members that we believe in free trade and we think it's right for the country. And, and we need this not just for this president, for the next president. And so I think we prevailed on that. In the House, we had 191 Republican votes, 28 Democrats. We had 14 Democrats join us in the Senate. Most Republicans in the Senate supported this. So this is one of those rare opportunities that we've had. We're gonna see if we can parlay this into a few other accomplishments this year. But if America, on a bipartisan basis, told the world, we're not going to try to get trade agreements, we don't want to engage, we don't want to write the rules of the global economy, think of the punctuation mark that that would have placed upon this narrative that America is in decline. We, as Republicans, can say, look, we don't agree with his foreign policy. We don't agree with these, Iran and Russia and ISIS. But if we said we're also going to participate in stopping trade and not negotiating trade agreements, then the rest of the world would say, oh, this isn't an aberration of these eight years. This is America now. America's past its prime. And I do not want to see this narrative being perpetuated 
that America has passed its, 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 its best days. I want to perpetuate in America that we're getting back on track, we're going to fix our country, we're confident, and we're going to lead. Let's, let's, um, <laughs> let's talk about the domestic, one aspect of the domestic side of that. We ran into Bob Putnam out there, and we were talking about his fine new book and Charles Murray's uh, book of a couple of years ago, both of which focus very much, of course, on uh, challenges, obstacles, barriers to upward mobility uh, in America, our apparent, the apparent inability of some of the old ways of doing things, maybe on both the left and right, to address poverty. Um, you've taken a lead on poverty in the last couple of years. So, uh, talk about that. Yeah, so uh, when you and I knew each other back in the 90s, I was working for Jack Kemp, um, working on his poverty initiatives back in those days. Um, thinking that we could make a difference. We did welfare reform and a couple of other things. And when we saw the 50th anniversary and the war on poverty coming up last year, um, I and some others decided to take a deep dive into this issue, um, toured the country for two years uh, with a friend of mine, Bob Woodson, an old civil rights leader um, from the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, touring poor communities throughout the country and listening to people who are on the front lines of the war on poverty. Um, and spent a year scrubbing through the federal government, through the budget, through all the programs that we have, measuring whether or not programs are succeeding or not, to come up with a conclusion that I think is indisputable, which is we're not winning the war on poverty. Uh, read Bob Putnam's book, by the way. It's a fantastic book. Um, he does a very good job of showing where we're going in America. And let me just say a couple of things. Number one, we had a 50-year war on poverty. And we now measure success based upon inputs, based on our effort. How many programs do we have? How much spending are we committing to this program? How many people are on these programs? We are not measuring success in the war on poverty based upon whether we're getting people out of poverty or not, based on results. And this is the kind of dialogue change that has to happen. So another bipartisan effort, Patty Murray and I, she's a, a senator from Washington. I've worked with her on the bills before. We hope later this summer we're going to pass a bill um, changing our measurement system of program success based on outcomes, not on inputs. And we want to have that kind of a conversation because if we simply focus on the old fight, it's going to be Republicans against Democrats, liberals against conservatives, not what works and what doesn't work. And if we can switch this fight to what works and what doesn't work, then I feel like we can make progress because where we are today, upward mobility is stagnant. If today, if you were raised poor, you are just as likely to stay poor today as you were 50 years ago. So we have an economic mobility problem in America. It's not for lack of trying, it's not for lack of resources, it's for lack of creativity, it's for lack of effective um, planning. And the other thing I would say is, we took this notion that Washington can manage this situation from the top down, have a bunch of bureaucracies, make them efficient, and they can manage this. That doesn't work, it isn't working. And when you add up all of these poverty programs we have, it has basically created this perverse incentive called the poverty trap, where you, it pays you not to work. Um, if you're a single mom with one child, and you make the minimum wage, and you're on Medicaid, uh, housing assistance, food stamps, and you get the earned income tax credit. If you get offered a job that pays you $3 an hour more per hour, you add up what, what it looks like, you take into consideration your taxes and the benefit losses you will get by taking that better job, and you will only get to keep 10 cents on every extra dollar you earn. So the highest marginal tax rate isn't Bill Crystal or Walter Isaacson or probably just about everybody in this building. The highest marginal tax rate is that single mom making you know, $25,000 a year um, who, who, who is losing 80 to 90 cents of the dollar when she tries to take a leap of faith and go work. So these are things we have to deal with. We have to make work pay. We have to make work work. And so that's why I think we need to overhaul our safety net because the safety net's designed to catch people falling into poverty. It's really not designed to get people out of poverty. And that's why I think we need to take a new approach and respect people on the front lines who are doing the effective poverty fighting. Listen to them, learn from them, get behind them. Government can provide resources, but government's screwing up the implementation of this, if you ask me. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Let me ask one more policy question, and then maybe a word or two about that 2012 campaign, which I had successfully blocked out for the last yeah. two, two or three oh, years yeah. until you reminded me of it. Um, and, uh, and that's on, on entitlements. I think no one has done more to call attention to the challenge of dealing with entitlements than you have. And 
in Washington. You brought the Republican Party against all predictions around to a, your plan to uh, begin to curb entitlement growth. Uh, you've worked with Democrats like Patty Murray on that to some degree as well. Are we going to get entitlements under control and can we do it responsibly? I saw Donald Trump attacked you the other day for trying, said it was a, Donald Trump who's a noted political expert, he's been elected so many times to things, said Paul Ryan's political judgment was horrible and the party would suffer if it followed his, his uh, Paul Ryan road on entitlements. So. Well, uh, let me just say he doesn't speak for me. Um, um, first of all, we have to get a handle on entitlements. The question that I don't know the answer to you to is can we do it responsibly? Meaning, can we do it now on our own terms as a country, or do we wait till we have a European-like moment where we've got a debt crisis on our hands? Um, what we've been advocating is patient-centered health care, where people have more control over their health care. They and their doctors run the decision-making process, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or health insurance for, for people under 65. Health care is the big issue. Health care, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security um, are the big three, they say. And in about 15 or 20 years, they'll consume 100% of all federal revenues, meaning no money for anything else we do, for defense, education, environment, nothing. So that's the path we're on, and it's basically because baby boomers are retiring and far fewer people are following them in the workforce, and the programs they use go up in spending six to 8% a year. So we have to change the way these programs work so that we can better fulfill their mission, but without bankrupting the country, because we have tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded liabilities. The answer to your question is, we already know enough through the witness of our private economy that competition and choice, it works. You, Peter Thiel's sitting right over here. I mean, you can, you can bring cost down and quality up in the private economy. Why can't we do that in these areas, like our health and retirement security? The answer is we can, but we're not. And so the kinds of reforms that we're proposing, which involves more individual choice, more innovation, more customization, more markets, um, we believe is how to fix this. And what I mean responsibly is, the sooner we do this, the sooner it doesn't affect anybody in or near retirement. So the political transition is gradual, it's easy. You're not taking anything away from somebody who already retired based upon the promise that government made to them. But if we do keep kicking this can down the road, which for the last eight years we have, and not tackle this entitlement problem, then we will have a mess on our hands, it will look European-like, We'll have a run on the bond markets. Who knows what it does to our currency? But more importantly, we will have no choice but to pull the rug out from other people who have already retired. So our goal is to fix this before it becomes ugly. And I think the kinds of reforms we're talking about make them better. Give you more control over your life, more control over your health care, and get at the root cause of inflation. You know, actually have a health care sector where, where people want to go into this sector, where doctors are free to innovate, where we have a free market that works. There's no reason why we can't do that. We spend more money than anybody else on healthcare than any other country. We just don't spend it intelligently. You, um, and, and I do think, turning to the 2012 election, um, you know, you were put on the ticket and that was going to be so difficult to defend the Medicare cuts, so-called cuts in, in the Republican budget that you had worked on and led through the House. And in fact, whatever the causes of 2012, no one thinks that that contributed much one way or the we other. We won the right? senior vote by double digits. Yeah, my mom and I ran around Florida doing town hall meetings on Medicare uh, for about a month, and we won the senior vote by double digits. And so what did you learn? I'm just curious, very few of us, obviously, have gone through the kind of campaign that you went through, and you do one great advantage, one reason I respect elected officials so much is both that they put their name on the line and risk defeat, uh, and also that they do deal with actual Americans. You deal with them in your district in Wisconsin, which is a very sort of middle American district, mm -hmm. I think a 50-50 Democratic-Republican mm -hmm. district, mm -hmm. middle class, but you also deal with them when you're running for uh, vice president or president of the United States. I'm just curious, what, what surprised you about the campaign? What, what would surprise us about your experiences on the road for those incredibly intense two and a half months, either the VP campaign or also being a, an elected official, being a congressman from the first district of Wisconsin? Yeah, in, in 2012, I guess I learned one important lesson. Um, the electoral college really matters. <laughs> There's a point in that, and the point is, um, for, for Republicans, for conservatives, we have to show really who we are and what we believe and what we're trying to do. We have to be a, a big tent where we include people and bring people in. And I believe that if you take our principles, the founding principles, liberty, freedom, free enterprise, self-determination, you know, government by consent of the governed, these, these are really important principles that made us so special in the first place. 
to more perfect the American idea, which I've heard from people just in the last, a lot of people don't believe in the American idea anymore. The condition of your birth determines the outcome of your life, doesn't determine the outcome of your life. You know, you can make it if you work hard. If you make a mistake in America, you can redeem yourself. There are a lot of people who don't believe that that is there for them. So it's our job to show how it can be, how we take our principles, apply them to the problems of the day to show real solutions that evolve everybody. Better ideas for effectively fighting poverty and reigniting upward mobility. Better ideas for actually solving healthcare problems, getting this debt under control. A better foreign policy to make us safer and stronger and more respected. Um, faster economic growth, by the way. Underneath all of this, we need to grow our economy a heck of a lot faster. And we, we have the potential to, and we're not. Um, and I would argue, but for our government, in so many ways, we're not. And so what I learned is we have to have a more candid conversation with the country and do it in a way that is inclusive, that is appealing, that is aspirational and relatable um, and, and campaign everywhere. You know, not just the handful of states, but everywhere um, to really try to show this election for the high stakes of election that it really is. And that's the kind of election I want to have. And I believe in specifics. And this is something that, you know, I've been hit for this a lot. Um, tell people who exactly you are, what you plan to do if elected, and then if you win that election, then you have the moral authority, then you've won the mandate, then you can go do it. And so I think the days of the vague platitudes or the personality contest, those gotta go away. And who are we, what are we gonna do, what is the program, what are we planning, and why are we doing this, and why do we believe this? That's the kind of election I think we have to have for us to be successful, and that's the kind of election I just yearn to see in this country. Um, and for as far as just being elected in Congress, um, people are really nervous about the future. There's a, the anxiety is palpable. Some are doing well, some communities are doing okay, but it's palpable. Whether it's threat for, threats from overseas or just the fear that your, your child is not going to have the kind of opportunities that even you had. That's palpable. And and good thing for us, and good thing for this country, it's overcomable. We can fix it. Um, but that's what's going on in America, I would say. Uh, Deep-seated anxiety, people giving up, uh, especially in poor communities. And I do believe, for one, we need to have a clarifying election to get through that, and I think we can. Would you like to make news here at the Aspen Ideas Festival? No, I wouldn't. Tell us. <laughs> I'll finish that sentence yeah, anyway. Fifteen and, people. Yeah. And tell us who you would. Which which Republican candidate would you like to uh, would you like to endorse here? <laughs> So you would like to know. You know? Yeah, uh, so it's, it's off the record, really. He, it's, the, we know each other pretty well. The fact that it's being live streamed around, it's, right, no, one will, right. no, one will, no one will pay attention. So given that I am the chair of the general fund for the, uh, for the party, I'm, I'm in this role where I'm helping prepare for the nominee when that person arrives, because one of the mistakes we think we made is we had to scramble to create a general election campaign against an incumbent um, late. So what we're doing is we're pre-building the campaign right now so when that, you know, the bricks and the mortar and the, and the data and the, all of the things that you have to do so that when that person arrives, it's kind of a turnkey operation, which is a long, multi-sentence way of saying, I'm not going to answer his question. <laughs> and, and you're not going to And you're not going to reconsider your decision not no. to run? No, no I'm not going to. Okay, I give up. Uh, um, tell me, you know, we mentioned, uh, you mentioned, I think, foreign policy in passing. I don't want to dwell on that. There are other good panels, like Dave Petraeus is speaking here in a second, isn't he? Um, but uh, defense, one of the things the Republican budget did this year, President's budget also, inc after many years of cutting defense, increases defense a bit or stops the hemorrhaging of defense, the way one might put it. The Republicans also tried to do the same. Um, t t talk about that. I yeah. mean, that's, that's an area I know that you had been, you know much, you, you've been more involved in that than people realize. They think of you in the entitlements, right. poverty, trade. Talk about the defense budget and what is necessary for our just to, for our basic obligations around the right. world. Yeah, I, I chair the Ways and Means Committee now, but I had been chairing the Budget Committee the last uh, two terms. And so uh, I had to put together a budget agreement with Patty Murray, who we mentioned earlier, um, to pro prevent defense from getting hit really hard uh, in the last two years. That agreement is now expired. And so we're going into another fight over defense. Uh, we will see if the Senate can filibuster, the Democrats will filibuster the defense bill, and if they can, then we're gonna have a fight over our military. Why does this matter? This matters because after Afghanistan and Iraq, we need to reset our force structure. You can imagine the kind of wear and tear that, that the equipment gets, number one. Number two, we're shrinking our, our brigades. We're shrinking our combat-ready brigades. 
and um, we have to keep our advantage on technology. And our Navy is getting very small. Um, the budget that the president sent us the, day, the week Putin invaded Crimea, he proposed to bring our Navy to a level we have not seen since before World War I. He proposed to bring our, nar our Army down to a, a level we haven't seen since before World War II. And he proposed to shrink our Air Force to a level we've never seen before. And so when, when, when governments do that, when America does that, it tempts others. It creates a vacuum. It shows a sense of vulnerability. And so we believe that that's very dangerous. So we've been trying to work on a bipartisan basis to prevent that from happening or to at least reverse the slide and to rebuild our military so that we do have a honest to goodness, peace through strength doctrine. We're gonna have um, a fiscal fight this fall, much like the one Patty and I sort of worked on two years ago. Hopefully what will come out of that is, 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 is keeping the military from getting sequestered again. Um, but at the end of the day, the next, because this president has given us six budgets that are just devastating to the military. The last two were not as bad, um, but he's not going to invest the, in what we think we need to, to have a, a strong, and the reason you want a big strong military is if you ever use it, you wanna make sure you, 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 you're keeping people safe. You wanna make sure that when you deploy troops, you have the resources and the manpower to be able to deploy enough so that who is being deployed are being be deployed in the safest possible manner. That's number one. Number two, we do not want to give other countries this notion that they can catch up so that they try. And that is, I think, one of our challenges with China, um, not so much with Russia, but one of our challenges with China. And this is something that is very dangerous, and we're on a very dangerous trajectory. But I believe we will probably have a fiscal fight, and my guess is we will have to put together another agreement, not unlike what you know, we did before, to, to stop the, the Pentagon from getting hit really hard again but we're going to have to rebuild our military in the next session of Congress with the next president. I hadn't really, let me close with a question we hadn't really, I hadn't really planned on asking, but since you mentioned China, on the one hand, you've, you're a free trader, uh, an engager, in a sense, with the world and with China. On the other hand, um, you've been hawkish on foreign policy, and then just recently we had, I mean, we didn't even, you, we didn't even mention cybersecurity as part right. of the right. new expensive tasks our military and our intelligence community have to assume. You've got, we've got one minute and 42 seconds. You can explain the future of the U.S.-China relationship. Yeah. Uh, we need to be strong. We need to be very strong, economically strong and militarily strong um, to, to help in ascending China ascend properly, peacefully, uh, to ascend in a way where it's American-style free enterprise that's being practiced. This is one of the reasons why I'm so strong um, of a believer in trade. This is one of the reasons why I fought tooth and nail with my party to get Barack Obama Trade Promotion Authority, because we are now in talks with the Japanese, with the Malaysians, with the Australians, with, with 11 Pacific nations, to have them agree to play by our rules, our intellectual property protections, our rule of law, our enforceable contracts, our cyber protection, give us access to their markets. And they want to play by our rules, the American-style system of free enterprise, versus the Chinese system of what I would call crony capitalism, intellectual property theft, and the rest, to serve as an effective counterweight to China. And that, to me, is one of the most important things we can do for an effective China policy, um, in addition to a bigger Navy. And people ask me, and in my party especially, well, why, why is Obama doing this? He's not for free trade. I think he believes that his Asia rebalancing strategy is the best thing he can salvage from his foreign policy. The Cairo speech, ISIS in Syria fiasco, Russia reset didn't work. The rebalancing to Asia is still salvageable. Two things you need to do for that. A bigger Navy, not gonna do that. Trade, he's gonna do that. And he's doing that. And I think he should be celebrated for doing that. And I think that's one of the best things we can do to put America in the driver's seat in Asia and in the world to write the rules of the global economy as our best China policy possible. That's great. Well, Paul, the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll close. I'll close by reminding you and everyone else that Bill Clinton did not get into the presidential race in 1991 until October 91, which means you still have, what, three months to reconsider your decision not to run in 2016. I'm so gonna go hike the U Trail with my 10-year-old. Go out on the U Trail with your 10-year-old, think hard about it, and reconsider. Anyway, thanks, Paul, so much for this.